this week, the government has come under fire owing to renewed calls for an end to unethical and illegal mining. The fire comes at a time when tensions are rising as the country nears the December 7th polls. In this election, Galamse, the other name for illegal mining, remains a pivotal public concern and so will electoral integrity and corruption. Galamse has had devastating effects on the environment and local economies, while corruption, on the other hand, continues to undermine trust in governance. That's where the National Commission on Civic Education steps in. Civic Education. Hence our focus on hot issues. I am Kemeni Amano, and today I sit with the head of the organization that plays a vital role in educating citizens and promoting civic responsibility. We'll explore how the Commission is tackling these critical challenges, ensuring a fair and transparent election, and contributing to the fight against corruption and illegal mining. My guest is Chairperson of the National Commission on Civic Education, Kathleen Adi. Welcome to Hot Issues. Thank you very much. I want to start with your work at the NCCE. Mm -hmm. You have a very, really crucial mandate when it comes to civic education in this country. How mm -hmm. would you say that is going? Well, it's going well, mm -hmm. um, particularly this election year. We're doing a lot of different things, a lot of activities. Um, we started off with a theme for the year that says, together we can build Ghana, so get involved. It's a rallying call mm -hmm. for everybody because in order for this democracy to work, in order for it to thrive, grow roots, um, and get stronger, every single citizen has a role to play. And that's what we are emphasizing, that each citizen must take up their role and play it seriously. That's the only way we can move forward. Mm. It's not up to one group of people, it's not up to just officials, but as citizens we have a critical role to play. And this year being like an election year, this is the year that we get to exercise the mandate to go and elect leaders. This right. is an important exercise. It's a civic duty, it's a responsibility, it's a gift actually that those who set up the republic gifted us with a democracy um, that requires that every four years you get to have a say mm. in who gets to lead us. I so see. it's a very busy year for us and uh, we've been all over the place running around mm -hmm. and uh, we are looking forward to a successful election as we normally do. We're looking forward to an election without bloodshed. We're looking forward to an election that doesn't require anybody to die for anybody to come into power. Right. And those are the things that we are working towards. Indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the challenges would you say you encounter mm -hmm. in trying to deliver on that mandate? Well, we do um, encounter a lot of challenges. First of all, this is a very big institution. It is a nationwide institution. It's decentralized. It's a constitutional body that has um, offices in every region, offices in every district, over 1,700 staff. And so it's, uh, it's, it's a, that's a challenging mm -hmm. environment just by itself. Yeah. What do you say to people who mm -hmm. think that the NCCE has outlived its usefulness? Oh, I don't think it's that outli it has outlived its usefulness. I think that the world is coming back to realizing that civic education is an important pillar of democracy, has been overlooked in most places, and countries are paying a very high price for, for, for that. A lot of the Western countries that are suffering now because of breakdown in society, lack of cohesion, and people, lack of patriotism and all of those things. It's because they defunded the civic education programs. Mm -hmm. It's on record. Yeah. At, the, at the end of the Second World War, even in the U, the, a lot of resources went into building, state building, building nations and building citizens, right? But once over time, when things stabilized and everything was going well, there was a defunding process that has now led to the situation that we find ourselves in, because, you know, the whole world is in a flux. Mm. It's not only Ghana that we have problems, you know. W would but you say that if we had, you know, prioritized the work you do mm -hmm. a little bit more as a nation, some of the problems that we are faced with today perhaps wouldn't be there? Absolutely. Simple things. Patriotism. Mm -hmm. A lot is hinged on that. Do people love, do we love our country enough? Do we even respect our national symbols? These are important things, right? The symbols of the state. We have come to a stage where we don't even sing national anthem. We don't even say the pledge. In, in, in the U.S., even before they play a game, they play national anthem. Mm -hmm. 
So there's this sense of pride, there's this sense of commitment and patriotism that you feel, that's your flag, you see the flag, you're, you're crying, you have an emotional attachment. It's not, it's not by chance. It's a process of teaching people to be, feel a particular way about a country that they belong to, you know. So, of course, if the resources were channeled, you know, we would have been in a better place. But, you know, it's not too late. I am not, and I am a very positive person, and I'm somebody who is a strong believer in the Ghana brand. If we start today, we will still get results. If we start to emphasize the important things that need to be emphasized in our society, how do we get people to be patriotic citizens? Mm -hmm. How do we get to a point where we don't have to police every single element of life, that people will genuinely do the right thing when no one is watching? And that's the definition of integrity. Mm -hmm. You know, where, where people don't just do the right thing when there's police. Driving, for instance. And I always say that when you look at the driving in the country, it gives you an idea of the civic culture. Right. Yeah, we are driving, nobody gives each other space, we are not courteous to each other, mm -hmm. and every opportunity we get, we break the traffic rules. Mm -hmm. Whereas, there are places that have no police on the road, right? But for the most part, it doesn't mean it's perfect there, mm -hmm. but for the most part, people drive. When they get to a junction, they stop. They give way to somebody else to go. When the traffic light is not working, people arrange themselves. One person will go from here, one person will Indeed. go from here, with no police assistance. I'm sure that you understand? But well, it is a consistent uh, uh, emphasis on building a certain type of... It doesn't happen mm, automatically. Mm. You have to invest the resources and the time to build that kind of society before you get it. Mm. Kathy, are mm -hmm. Ghanaians patriotic today? Not as patriotic as we should be. Giving the country we have, the gift of the country we have, given our history and how we've had to fight to get to this place, given the constitution we have, which although has many problems, is a great constitution that guarantees our rights, guarantees media freedom. If you know where we've come from, you know, you will know what great gifts these things are. So that we are not as patriotic as we should be, it's unfortunate. Mm. It should not be the case. Is it also the case that Ghanaians perhaps cannot afford patriotism at this point? I don't understand that. I, perhaps they still have to think about the bread and butter issues. They have to think about, you know, how safe and secure they are mm -hmm. before they think about the bigger picture of the country. Yes, patriotism is fundamental. And uh, I don't think it's either you are thinking of your bread and butter issues or... We are thinking of patriotism. Patriotism is part of your belief system. It's part of your value system. Loving your country is part of your value system. So, for instance, you can't commit a crime and say, well, I was hungry. No, a crime is a crime. Your being hungry is a separate issue, and that needs to be addressed, but that cannot be an excuse for criminal behavior. And that's why Galamze is such a bad thing, because the idea that, you know, well, it's a crime. Mm -hmm that is backed by powerful people and we must get all of them you understand so patriotism and bread and butter are not things that you must consider either or mm, patriotism indeed. is the basis right and if you have a patriotic citizenry then you have the building blocks for a great state because it is only patriotic citizens who can build a republic a proper republic Right? And it is only in building a proper republic that we will get the economic prosperity that we desire. All these things are linked. Indeed. It's not one or the other. Uh, indeed. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, you mentioned earlier that, of course, we have a constitution, but it also has its own issues. Mm -hmm. What are some of the issues that have been identified as far as your work at the NCC is concerned? Okay, so the, the issue of um, constitutional reforms has come up in the last couple of years. It's always been talked about. As usual, it's one of the things that we talk about all the time. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it's the Ministry of Parliamentary Affairs has taken the lead and is doing some very good work around it, of which NCC is part. Um, when you talk about this constitution, one of the biggest things we talk about is the, the fact of, um, the fact of uh, how do you call it, concentration of power in the presidency. Mm -hmm. And yes we all know until we actually work and get to the reforms we will only be talking about it the fact of majority of ministers coming out of uh, coming out of parliament mm -hmm. and thereby weakening the legislature is another big issue that we talk about 
a weakness in the constitution. But as long as we are just talking, the, the, it continues to be. For me personally, the biggest weakness in our constitution is the fact that we don't get to elect the heads of local government. Because people must feel the democracy at their doorstep, and that is at the level of local mm. government. That, that, that's a conversation I mm -hmm. know has gone on for a long yes. time, but we have failed to achieve that. Why do you think that is? Well, because generally speaking, we move slowly in Ghana. You know, we move slowly. Like I said, the, I know that the work is ongoing because NCC is part of a project being spearheaded by Ministry of Parliamentary Affairs that is doing, mm. uh, aggregating all the information um, have done a review process and are still taking the next couple of steps to ensure are, that... Are they building on the... And again, you don't speak for them, but you're involved in the yes. work. Are they building on the uh, previous white papers? Most certainly. Most certainly. Okay. That work was comprehensive mm -hmm. and really, truly, it captured almost everything simply because it was so decentralized and captured the views of really ordinary people on the street and all of that. NCC was part of that. We did the mobilizing for the town hall meetings across the country. So, I mean, the records are there. Mm -hmm. And so that, those reports, of we cannot have another review process. We, the, those reports form the basis of for what whatever is going today. on now. Yes. My guest today on Hot Issues is Madam Kathleen Adi. She is the chairperson of the NCCE. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, we'll assess the electoral climate we find ourselves in today. Mm -hmm. Don't go away. Welcome back. This is still Hot Issues with me in the studio is chairperson of the NCCE, Kathleen Adi. Uh, thank you so much for your patience, thank madam. You, thank you. So what is the NCCE's assessment of the current electoral climate in the mm -hmm. country? All right. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, every election in Ghana, um, every election year is a tense year. And as we get closer to the election, the tension goes up. And as a country, we have successfully put in place several mechanisms for sort of balancing the tension and working around the tension to a point where we are able to hold the election and come out at the other end. If you, every election, there's the narrative that says that this election is going to be so bad, we will not recover from it. Every single election of the First Republic, that's what has been said. Mm -hmm. But because of the really great mechanisms that have been put in place, like the Peace Council, like the mobilizing of the faith-based institutions, like the mobilizing of national leaders to work and support the electoral process mm -hmm. and birth it on the other side. Because of those things, eventually we come to this year, we have the same thing. There's a lot of talk, it's tense, it's going to be bad, it's going to be bloody, this and that. The, what I see different about this year, and I think that we don't even talk enough about that, is that this year we are living in a different world that the, the, the environment, the, the global environment represents a threat to us. Why am I saying this? If you look at the West Africa subregion, you see so many countries, you know, big democracies falling, you know, falling to violent extremists, falling to coup makers, falling to international geopolitical shifts here and there, going with this person one day and with this other force the other day. You see so much instability within the states. And as Ghanaians, we are not immune. Sometimes mm -hmm. we think that, you know, we are, we are special, we are God's people, yeah. But we are not immune right. from the troubles that surround us. Um, NCC, we are undertaking a big, a big um, peace and security project in the northern part of Ghana. I see. And uh, what we are doing is it's a violent, it's a, it's a preventing and containing violent extremism. And what we are doing there is ensuring that people in the, in, the, in the communities closest to the borders have an awareness of the external threat that we face as a country, know how to behave around people infiltrating their communities, mm -hmm and all kinds of things. It's a lot of work that's going on. And, 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 and the, that's the reason why, you know, not just NCC, a lot of institutions are doing that. The Ghana Army and other security forces are doing so much work along the borders to keep us safe and to keep the bad guys out. Mm. And so for me, the vulnerability this year is that, is the fact that if we are not careful, um, somebody out there will take advantage of our normal disagreements that we have during elections and set themselves into um, conflict 
that can be easily managed otherwise and create a bigger problem for us. Mm. So for me, that's the greatest source of vulnerability. That's what I view as the biggest threat for us. I, I mean, ex year. external, Exten external, external threat, yes. uh, threats. Yes. I, I, mean, I mean, again, so it brings me to an earlier point you made about the fact that mm -hmm. there's usually conversations about mm -hmm. how safety and security mm -hmm. of the country could turn out yes. in, in election yes. years. Are these not real threats, uh, you know, as far as the NCC is concerned? Oh, no, they are real threats. Mm. But I'm saying that over the years, the mechanisms that have been put in place have helped and they will continue to help. Okay. That's not to say that we are all clear. I mean, we can see from the skirmishes from by-elections, mm -hmm. recent by-elections, even the electoral process of going to um, register, going to uh, all the registration, voter registration mm -hmm. exercise, voter exhibition, all the skirmishes that come out of that give an indication that um, all the talk is not for nothing. You know, the talk is not for nothing. But hopefully the mechanisms will work. You know, and this year, one of the things we are really pushing, we push it every year, but we're pushing very hard, is that Ghanaians have to understand, especially young people, that going to give up your life or shed blood for a political party to come into power is a fruitless venture. It's a completely fruitless venture. We are hammering it down. Mm. That do not allow yourself to be used for this. I see. Yes. So, um, just just a few things, and then we'll move away from. Mm. Um, you know, electoral violence and extremism. Mm -hmm. um, you've touched on some of the by-elections and things mm -hmm. we have seen so far. How does the NCCE feel mm -hmm. about happenings in Wale Wale? It's, it's worrying. Mm -hmm. It's troubling. I mean, ballot box snatching, that one I thought we're done with. You understand? Because these were the early days of the Republic. It used to be a very popular thing for people to do, mm -hmm. you know, especially when we had the opaque ballot boxes. You know, because people, there was always suspicion that something was already in the box before it comes. That was one of the reasons that led to reforms. Having a transparent ballot box was a big reform for mm -hmm. us, you know, uh, uh, um, so that when the box is put down, we can all see that it's an empty box, mm -hmm. you know, and it gives people comfort and it helps people to build trust in the, in the system that is in place and all of that. And so to get to a point where, and it kind of went down a bit. I haven't heard of active ballot box snatching. You know, except for Parliament, but hey, that's another one. <laughs> that's another one indeed. That's you know, another one. So for, to see that happening in 2024 is very unfortunate. And I think that it is an indicator that, you know, people are determined to create a problem by all means. Mm. And it's very disturbing. I think we've come too far as a republic. We, we've gone past these things. Indeed. So it's unfortunate. But you see, for me, it boils down to law enforcement and cracking the whip on perpetrators who are found guilty of these kinds of things. It is the only way to stop it, you know. There's an element that requires education, but the biggest thing that will stop this thing immediately, will stop the election misbehavior immediately, is, is, is law enforcement. Mm. Because there are laws, there are laws for all of these things. We make this new legislation, this Public Order Act, there's a Vigilante, and there's the other one. Indeed. All of them are there to address these particular issues. So please, we have to take the law enforcement part of this thing very seriously. Very seriously. Mm -hmm. now, speaking of uh, cracking the whip, mm -hmm. one topic that has come up strongly mm -hmm. in, in the lead up to the December polls of mm -hmm. this year is the people, the about eight people who died mm -hmm. in, in the 2020 elections. Mm -hmm to know that there's still no justice for mm -hmm. these people. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about how the NCCE mm -hmm. is reading into that. Well, when people are killed during an election, it's not a public education problem, mm -hmm. you understand? So that will be our starting point. What is the public education that will be required is to help keep calm in the society, help understand, bring the understanding that you know, some things, some of these things happen. We must find um, better ways to resolve conflict. We have find conflict resolution mechanisms that did not have that do not have these sorts of outcomes because all of that was a result of misunderstanding conflict, whatever it is. So for us, that's the only role we play. We mm. cannot play a role in law enforcement. Mm. We cannot play a role in investigation. But it's worrying. It's isn't very it? disturbing. Yeah. But the disturbing of it is for all of us as Ghanaians. Mm. Because that sort of thing is the kind of thing that can spark, bring a spark of a problem that can 
quickly escalate and consume all of us. So as a Ghanaian, I find it disturbing. I find it disappointing, right? But as NCCE, our, 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 our role in that terrain will be trying to make sure that there are conflict resolution mechanisms mm. that help people to work through conflict without uh, getting to a point where we have this I kind mean, of so outcomes. So then your role does not extend to, um, you know, seeking justice? That we basically, are we saying that? What, what do you your, mean by I mean, your justice? role will mm -hmm. not extend, based on your mandate, mm -hmm. it will not extend to um, helping to seek justice for those people who perished True. in the 2020 in what, elections. In what way, for I mean, I, I mean, mm -hmm. wading into the conversation, ensuring that the people who, uh, you know, are, are in office now are able to get to the bottom of the matter. Mm -hmm. Is that something? And again, I'm only seeking clar I know, clarity. I understand, and I understand you because mm -hmm. people always ask these questions. It's, it's said that we don't give instructions to the IGP and the police. Mm. They, do you understand? Our work does not overlap in that way. So there are institutions for seeking justice. That should be doing their jobs. There are institutions for law enforcement. And so these questions must go to them. Mm. And then the questions around whether people are properly informed, people understand their rights enough to be able to seek justice. Now, that we can talk about. And, and what do you think about that? Do people understand their rights enough? If, um, if people at, at, at the polling stations, yes. at, the, at the collation centers. There's sentence. definitely a need for more work. There's definitely a need for one of the things I keep saying is that election day, go and vote. When you finish voting, go home. When it's time to count, come and count. When it's time to count, stand where the EC tells you to stand. Mm -hmm. Do you understand? And don't turn yourself into a self-proclaimed a self agent. The political parties have agents at every polling station. Mm. These agents have been trained by the Electoral Commission. They know what to do. They have the tools and the means to protect the ballot for the party. So you that you have not been assigned that role. You have no business going near, near that business. You see mm -hmm. what I mean? Mm -hmm. So let's also trust the system. We've had several elections. Let's learn to have a bit of trust in the system and do what we are supposed to. If the EC says stand here, and then you start coming close. You are creating... I mean, but do you think that officials make it difficult for the public to have complete trust in them? In what way? I mean, so that it, the conversation is not only about mm -hmm. uh, educating and advising mm -hmm. the public, mm -hmm. but also knowing that uh, the officials who are entrusted to do their job must exercise the necessary transparency and build the trust mm -hmm. relationships before we get to that point. Of course. But I, I mean, so, so then the question I'm asking is, uh, do you think that sometimes it is these officials who make it difficult for uh, the public who you educate mm -hmm. to actually practice what they are taught? To be honest, I can't tell. I can't make a pronouncement of that. I'm not there. I don't know the circumstances and I don't want to speculate. Mm. It's too sensitive a matter to speculate about if you don't have the full set of knowledge. Mm. So I can't say that for a fact. But all I Second. know is that, I, all I know is that, um, Officials must also play their role. Mm. I started by saying that as citizens, everybody has a role to play. And so those, those who are in the, in, the, in the area of managing elections and other organizations that support that process must take it upon ourselves to ensure that there's enough transparency so that people can have trust. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's when trust breaks down that you have people the emotions going high and people Indeed. feeling that they have to step in and do something about a certain situation. You mentioned the Peace Council earlier. Mm -hmm. Today there have been conversations about whether or not the Peace Pact is important. Mm -hmm. What does the NCCE think? The Peace Pact is important because it is important for leaders to give an indication that we will, do, we will work in a particular way that safety and security is something we will prioritize and that we will work within the system. There's always uh, 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 mechanisms for resolving electoral, or we've used them before. So we will use the system to resolve our problems. Mm -hmm. Giving a, pick, a going, signing a peace pact gives an indication to your followers that this is the orientation with which we are going into the election. Mm -hmm. And it helps calm things down. Because people look up to their leaders. Because people look up to their leaders, the leaders must um, work in a way that ensures that we all understand that this, this, we, are going, we are going to do this in a peaceful way. You understand? 
if there are problems that need to resolve, if there are conditions that need to be met. Because sometimes political leaders might say, we have some reservations. And so we can't come and append our signature to a certain uh, thing just as a box ticking exercise. Please, from your side, also try and hear us out and, and, and understand what our reservations are and do something about it. Mm -hmm. Then we are all equal. And I think that that is a conversation that must be had. And we are adults. And people must take, we must, and because a conversation is not just you talking and then you talking and not hearing. Mm. You must hear the other person. We must take steps to address issues so that everybody will feel comfortable around the table. I see. Mm -hmm. I mean, what are your concerns around the December polls, given the current climate we find ourselves in? Uh, I've mentioned that already. Mm. Yeah, I am worried about external threat. Mm. And of, obviously, the, the, the normal tensions that we, we experience as, as it gets closer. Right. I'm worried about young people, you know, shedding blood, losing life and limb over elections. It's, it's a great source of pain for me because it's truly a worthless exercise. It is truly right. a worthless exercise. And so we are really encouraging young people, no matter how bad your situation is, not having life is worse. Losing a limb is worse. Mm -hmm. Shedding blood is worse. And you may think that you are the hard guy. You can shed somebody's blood. They will come for you as well. You have to understand the way conflict is. You are not going to hurt somebody and get away with it. You know, because as your emotions are high, so will theirs be. And that's why sometimes they say you have to manage conflict so it doesn't, the horses don't bolt. Mm. Because once the horses bolt out of their souls, then you can't pull it back. Because at that point, everybody is just going at it. Indeed. And we are not different too. We are not different from the people in Rwanda. We are not different from the people in Sierra Leone or Liberia where conflicts that have been left to, were left to fester and then escalate and explode into many, many people dying. So we have to understand, we have to be humble about our humanity right. and the fact that we are not that special. And that if we don't manage situations and they explode, all of us, all of us. We'll and you know, you know where we are now? Mm. Ghana is a destination for all the people who have problems in West Africa. This is their island of peace. Uh, why do you say that? Well, because it's the truth. You check around. You find communities of West Africans springing up all over the place today. New communities. As far as I once went to the islands in the Osi region, we're crossing the water, crossing the water, and there was a new settlement of people from West Africa there. Mm. And, the, and that was, so this was, I think, I was there in 2020, and they had been there in like the last two years. Mm. You understand? I'm just telling you that our environment is not such that you can walk to the next country and find some peace. Right. Here is where the peace the is. Peace is and we and must here protect. is where people are, we must protect this one because if the Ghana goes, we are finished. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, uh, to what extent is voter inducement a threat to our elections? As well? A huge threat. If you followed us on NCC, you will realize that monetization of politics is one of our big areas of um, uh, um, public education that we are doing this year. The others are, so we have four big themes around which we are working this year. Monetization, violence, intemperate language, extreme behavior, religious intolerance, and fake news and misinformation. These are the big threats to this year's elections. So um, the money issue is huge. It's such a threat, not just to the election, but to our existence. It's an existential threat. Our country could fall because of that, because it interferes with true democracy. Mm -hmm. You understand? And democracy is a balancing act. Right. You must get all the pieces in place, then you're working through it. But if one piece falls off, the whole thing will collapse. Now, the idea of democracy is to go out there and elect a person on the basis of a contest of ideas, right? We have bastardized that process to mm. a point where we are actively buying and selling votes. Whereas in the past, this used to happen under the table. Then we'll hear rumors that, hey, they were sharing matches, they were sharing this. Yeah. Today, we have people saying, yes, this is how much we are giving our delegates. Why, why this, have people become so emboldened? And we also have the, the, the electorate insisting that this year, we are, this is what we are collecting. If they don't give us this much, we won't vote. Mm -hmm. I mean, we laugh about it. It's a very, very, very serious negative development in our democracy. 
I think we've, we've come this far because, as usual, we allow things to fester. We allow wrong things to fester. We should have nipped it in the bud early. But mm. again, it's not too late. For us, the public education element that is required, again, we are doing it aggressively. Are people are, listening to you? Well, we have to listen because let me tell you something. There is no money tree. I think I've said this thing so much that it's become a national anthem. There's no money tree anyway. Where all you have to do is get there, pluck a few, and come and share. Every money that is used for elections comes from some place. And now we are seeing that maybe even Galamze is contributing. So, for instance, assuming that Galamze is the source, somebody comes and, and, and poisons the water that we all drink and destroys the forest reserves that provide life for all of us, right? And brings the money. And then you take your 2,000, 1,000, 1,000, 1,000. And then you elect that person. Honestly, they're only going to go back for more mm -hmm. of where that came from. If they borrowed the money, they're going to find a way to pay for it. There's no free money. Mm. So if you are taking the money, you have to understand that you are, you are giving up something. And what you are giving up is much greater than the value of the money you are taking. If we start thinking about it in that sense, rather than thinking about it in the sense of, ah, well, it's a politician, so I'm taking my share. If we stop thinking that way and we start thinking strategically in the sense that this money that I'm taking, there are consequences because I'm not the only one taking it. But that's the education you have been given for years and it's only got worse. Will punishment work against... That's what I'm telling you. That education always goes to law enforcement. Right. Again, there are laws, there are laws against this, these things, you know. So we must... So if we fail to apply the laws, the education becomes wasteful. The education... Slightly ineffective. Let, slightly. Me, let me more diplomatic. <laughs> Slight, slightly ineffective. Yes. Okay. You know, and, and, and it, 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 it doesn't help because we are pouring resources into the education, even if it's small. In the, in the same way, that law enforcement mm. work, must work to make it, to make it effective. You, you, you see what I right. mean? Yeah. Because it's, it won't be fair to people if they don't know and you start, you know, I that's see. why the education so, is important. So just before we take another break, mm -hmm. I want us to uh, look at the issue of the language politicians are using this mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm. What's your assessment? I told you, our uh, other big thing is violence, interpret language, insults, and so on and so Are forth. the politicians behaving themselves? No, they are not. And it's unfortunate. Again, we've come a long way in this republic. But we must begin to punish wrong behavior through how we reward politicians you understand we must begin to punish wrong behavior because at the end of the day politicians are not inherently bad people or some evil people mm -hmm. they're us they come out of us no politician came from mass they're all like us right if you live in a family and there's somebody who continuously behaves in a certain way if the family does not like that behavior and we find a way to make the person pay for that behavior, most likely they will change, especially for a politician who is a very rational creature, only wants to be in politics. Many want to genuinely serve their communities. Mm -hmm. But we get to a point where um, when people are misbehaving, then we are giving them funds, so to speak, right? We are hailing them. Mm -hmm. We are giving them front row seats. We are repeating their negative energy. We are giving them platforms to do even more. What would be the motivation for them to stop? And we are rewarding them by giving them power. What will be the motivation for them to stop? We have a role to play in this. We have a role to... In an ideal situation, a leader will be such that they themselves will know that this is the wrong thing, I shouldn't do it. Mm. But when you don't have an ideal situation, the people must ensure that they exert enough of the power that is within them, that they are the ones who get to elect. They must use that power in a way that rewards good behavior and punishes bad behavior. Mm. So that's the angle of the education. Are we a long way from that thinking as a We are as a, a way. Nation? I won't say long because I'm too positive. We, we are, are some way. way from there. But the only way to bridge that gap is to keep at it. Mm. You see, to keep doing the education, to keep doing law enforcement. We will get to it. Are, are, all the parties, are all the parties culpable when it comes to use of intemperate language? The parties, the candidates, the movements? Yes, because it happens at different levels, you know. Okay. It can happen at a high level. It can happen with mid-level operatives. It can happen with low-level operatives. If you look at all of that, I think they are all culpable. Are there particular people that are a source of 
concern for the NCCE? Um, I won't name anybody right now. Mm. But you but, want us to be able to... Yes, because also for NCCE as an institution, our work is not always front-facing. We do a lot of back-end uh, um, back work as well. And so we tow a fine line um, between these things. And there's a time and a place for, for everything. This is not the time and place. You think so? We are only three months away from not the elections. Not this program, not today. No, not today. <laughs> but it, it, I mean, it will but, go. Yes, but definitely we should get to that point. Where we know. name and shame. Where we name and shame. But we must get to a point of naming and shaming where the naming and shaming is effective. But does not rather impede work and make it difficult to move forward. Mm. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. Meaning that we are naming and shaming, law enforcement is taking action. Do you understand? If all of that is happening together, and after we've done advice, after we've called people behind the scenes, after we've in done interventions and all of that, we get to that point. I hope you understand what I, I'm saying. I, I yes. absolutely understand. Yes. So, we'll take another break. Okay. While we come back, more on the threats to our, our elections this mm -hmm. year. We'll also look at the fight against Galamse sure. and a few others. Don't go away. Mm -hmm. Today, my guest is chairperson of the NCC, National Commission on Civic Education, Madam Kathleen Adi. Uh, thank you so much again for your patience and sitting with us here on Hot Issues. Thank you. We mentioned earlier that you usually do some surveys, and in yes. 2024, you are yet to launch the Matters of Concern. Yes, the survey uh, has been done, the report is being written, mm -hmm. and will be complete at the end of the month. In, indeed. Yes. Uh, wh what would you say are the Matters of Concern to the Ghanaian voter? I think that so this is what I think, that in Ghana, the issues that plague us are the issues that plague us. And uh, um, much as political parties have an angle, we cannot run away from the fundamentals of what we need as a people. People are concerned about education. People are concerned about health. People are concerned about jobs. Jobs, I think that... Jobs is very important. People want to earn an honest living. For the most part, people want to earn a living and just live a normal life and have opportunity to grow uh, and, to, and to prosper economically. That's what people want. Mm -hmm. and, that, that, and when you look at matters of concern, these are the issues. Agriculture, security, yeah. you know, people want opportunity and people want a fair playing field. People want, uh, you know, we want to live in a just society where everybody has the opportunity to be the best version of themselves. Let mm. me put it that way. That's what people want. Yeah, I mean, and when you think about it, mm -hmm. it would appear to be the root cause of a lot of the problems we have. That is it. That is it. Sometimes people don't feel like they have justice, like we talked about. Sometimes mm -hmm. people don't feel that they have the opportunities that others have. Of course, there will always be those who have more than others. That's not what this is about. It's about a system that gives everybody a chance mm -hmm. so that uh, uh, um, your lack of wealth does not block you mm. from education, for instance, right? Or your lack of wealth does not endanger you health-wise. You see what I mean? And when I talk about equal opportunity, that's what I mean. Mm. Everybody in every society, some will have more than some. But that should not be the basis for blocking your access to basic things. This mm -hmm. week, the NCC has had reason to complain mm -hmm. about Galam. Say you've mm -hmm. called for an end to illegal and unethical mining. Mm -hmm. Why now? This is not the first time we're talking about this. Okay. Part of our mandate is what we call environmental governance. If you mm -hmm. look at our... Indeed. Uh, yes, environmental governance is part of our mandate. Um, and, and for Ghana... Uh, our big environment issue is really Galamze. And we've, we are watching it get worse and worse and worse. Mm. And what is really making me excited today, in the last week, and hopefully in the weeks to come, is how citizens have taken charge of the situation. Because this is how the democracy is supposed to work. Is it really citizens or is it just people who are far away from these places where no, the gold no. is? No. Are you saying that the people who are members of TUC, don't have relatives in Galamze? Are you saying that uh, the, the people who other professional groups... I mean, we well, shouldn't talk as I if... Mean, but, I'm, but I'm saying yeah. that the people who are involved in Galamse, mm -hmm. 
uh, they are not making that call. They feel that it is their best right to reach the gold. It is their economic mm -hmm. freedom mm -hmm. to reach the gold. Which is true to an extent. Gold, the idea of mining is not a bad idea. We've been mining gold on this blessed land for over 500 years, and there's still more. So mining itself is not the mining of it. It is the way you are mining that's the problem. There's legal mining. Mm -hmm. There's legal mining that we are all familiar with. There's artisanal mining mm -hmm. that is legal. Where community mining, where people in the community have every right. Mining should not be just about giving concessions to international companies. The people of the land have every right to benefit from the gold that the land produces. But there is a process to it. You don't just get up one day, get your hands on some mercury and pour it into the river. You cannot do that. You cannot do that. That is a crime. That's got nothing to do with mining. That is a criminal activity that must be dealt with as a crime. I see. But, I mean, so who is to blame then for where we, we find ourselves today? It's not. So let me, let's take this step by step. Okay. Right? What I'm saying is that I'm happy that big organizations like TUC, like the big professional bodies, are speaking about this. I reason that we shouldn't discount that as nothing. We should never discount that. That mm -hmm. is important. That is the people raising their voice. That is representatives of the people raising their voice. Look, if you, work in, if you are a member of TUC and you work in the public sector, do you know how many lives every public sector salary touches? Every person who is paid in the public sector, most people, the salary touches many people beyond their immediate family. True? Mm -hmm. So don't think that uh, these people are just talking. They, everybody in Ghana is connected to the Galamsi one way or the other. If it's not happening in your community, it's happening in another community. Even if it is not happening in any community you come from, to the extent that they are poisoning the source of water for all of us, you are also affected. So it is not really true that, oh, it is only people who are sitting in the city who know, who have a problem with it. We all have a problem with it. Recently, you saw there was a place in the eastern region. They came yes, together. the community. Yes, they chased the people away. So the, it's not that the awareness is not there. It's just that sometimes people feel, uh, people don't feel but it's, empowered. It's, it's taking quite a bit for that awareness. It doesn't to, matter. It's happening come. now. It's better late than ever. It's happening now. And we just need to build this momentum and not lose it. We have to keep the momentum and not lose it. More communities have to stand. The leaders, the traditional authority, and the people of the community must stand and say, no, we are not doing this. Will this go anywhere when we hear that the people who are supposed to lead us are mm -hmm. themselves engaged in this? But the people who are supposed to lead us, who made them leaders? Who made them? We made them leaders. We cannot make them leaders. We can ensure that whoever is leading us will do what we want them to do. I we see. have not used our power properly. Look, I keep, when you say that people say, what's the point of leadership? It's true. Ideally, you must have a certain type of leadership whereby, you know, things don't go so way out of hand. But if that does not, if that does not happen, it doesn't mean that we, the citizens, must just sit, sit down and watch. What we are doing now is very important. You know, please, media, let's not discount it. Mm. Let's not always look at the negative side, oh, but this didn't work, that, no, we are doing something now. Well, we're also comparing to history mm -hmm. and the fact that we have seen a lot of agitations. Mm -hmm. uh, many of them have not worked. A couple of them have, Yes, but many of them haven't well, worked. I'm glad you said and, a couple and, of them have. And mm -hmm. in the case of Galamsey, mm -hmm. when we know that Certain things have happened under this administration mm -hmm. for Galamse to have been nipped in the back, mm -hmm. back but it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it creates a certain condition to not trust that the agitations mm -hmm. we are seeing today mm -hmm. uh, will yield any positive results. Mm -hmm. I wonder why you are so positive about it. I'm so positive because I believe in people action. I'm a strong believer in that. And I know that politicians, I keep telling you, are rational people. Mm -hmm. And they will do what the people want them to do because they want votes. Isn't it such a disappointment that the people who lead us are the same people allegedly engaged I, in I, I, destroying I, no, our the environment? The point is that I don't want to speculate on what is disappointing and what is not disappointing. What are we doing? What should we do? Disappointing or not, you know, that, that's not, as, as an institution... You know, it won't matter to you. It does, not that it won't matter. That's not the angle. The angle okay. for us is that what are we doing? What 
how are citizens taking charge of their affairs in mm. the sense that they are now waking up to it and their representatives, the trade unions, the faith-based institutions, people who actually speak for ordinary people mm. are saying that no, we will not have this. People are saying that we are going to lay down our tools. People are saying that we are going to tell our congregation to not vote for people who do this and that or speak this way and that way. That's the way we exercise but in, our power. In, in educating mm -hmm. you know, the citizens about their responsibility to the environment, mm -hmm. where does the NCC draw the line for people who think that they need to you know, work and get, get money through some of these unethical and illegal mining yes, activities like I said, and mining, their responsibility, no. their mining, responsibility to, mining, to the environment? The mining is not an illegal activity. No, I, no so my reference is to so unethical and illegal mining. So it's for people to understand the difference. You understand? People must understand but the but, difference. But when you engage some of these people That's on the I'm ground, saying. what do they, like, I mean, what, what is the response? Are they understanding what you're telling them? So let me, let me, let me put it this way. Um, we all see how sometimes there are pockets of people who are resistant to the idea that they must stop the Galamzi. But we have to understand that the Galamzi is benefiting individuals and in destroying communities. Even if the individuals are from the communities, the greater majority of the community is getting the negative effect and all of us are getting it, right? I can only say that the public education will go on. And law enforcement must do its work. There is not, mining is not illegal automatically. Mm. The point we are saying is that we don't want illegal mining that poisons the waters and destroys the, 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 the land. It, 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 and, do, do you engage these, uh, you know, mine workers? Do you engage oh, well, the mine you know, workers? In every district, like I know I started telling you that in every district, people do the work that is relevant to the district. So if that is the issue in the district, we will definitely be engaged. Well, I can imagine that there are many districts where the NCC The point I'm making is that we must stop looking at this as, oh, some making up excuses for illegal activity. And once you tell people that it's illegal activity, the rest is up to them. No, I, if they want to keep that. taking the risk, right? Then law enforcement must make it very, very, must make the outcome very uh, uh, difficult to swallow for them. I see. You, you see what I mean? I, I know, and I absolutely I see what you mean. But I don't have a database to you, respond to what you're saying directly like that. So I can't respond to that right now. I see. But I can tell you that once you do public education, the, in order for that to be effective, you must have law enforcement. So, so, so what I'm asking told, is, the public yeah. education you are doing, yes. are you doing it for people, the mine workers also, they, they themselves who are exposed to the effects of the, of the cyanide, of the mercury, and, and, and the impact it's having on the environment? By all means, that's the case. But I'm saying that when people are not responding because they are getting their personal gain mm. and they are not weighing the thing right, the only thing left is law enforcement. Well. That's, that's, do you understand what I'm mm. saying? Yes, the education is going on. But if you are educating people, right, and they are getting an immediate gain and they, they are willing to sacrifice not just themselves, their children, their mothers, their fathers, mm -hmm. they are, that's what they are doing. Right, they are willing to sacrifice all of that because they'll make they'll be rich people today. Very well. Then the only thing that can get them is law enforcement. What is the NCC's view mm -hmm. on the state of corruption today? Well, um, or the fight against corruption. You know, for I think from 2016 or maybe 2015 to about 2020, we were um, we did a big anti-corruption program across the country, which was funded, which was externally funded. And um, what I would say about corruption is that, for me, I always like to go to fundamentals and, and basics, right? I think corruption has become a, a, a cultural issue. And I'm not saying culture in the sense of this is how our ancestors behave, no. I'm saying that it has become almost part and parcel of us. And like I was telling you during the break, nothing I find more absolutely crazy than... Mm -hmm. People who even go to the extent of helping their children cheat in exams. They go and buy questions. They go and pay and get a poor for their yeah. children. And it's normalized. Now, when you have a society where that goes on and is normalized, where parents can sit among themselves and say that, oh, this is where they are poor. Let's go and buy it for these children. Then you can understand that the problem is deep. And mm. that problem requires a solution that is um, 
deep, fundamental, and sustained. You know, they say we must start with children. I say we must start at every level. Mm. And again, when we catch those who are corrupt, let's deal with them. Let's teach people the right values. You understand? Right from the beginning, mm -hmm. right from childhood. Let's put civic education back in the curriculum where people get the values. Let's have a civic education um, program that goes from the day you enter nursery right up until the day you finish your first, your, 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 your post, post high school, your first mm -hmm. tertiary. Let's have a program that runs. That is how we, are we show that we are committed to a certain thing, not one off. Mm -hmm. One of programs will not work. Will not work. Yes, we have are, a corruption are, are problem. There, mm -hmm. Are there any efforts to bring civic education back? We are, we are, we are working on, working it. on Hopefully. it. Hopefully. But in the meantime, we work through our civic education clubs in the schools. But it's not enough. Mm -hmm. You understand? We have to put it in we, our schools. It has, to be, it has to be a specialized program. We have to put it so that every, every term mm -hmm. you do a civic education course. And it's incremental. You build on it, you build on it, you build on it. I see. You, you, you see what I mean? Very well. Cassie, but if thank we you. do this one of things... It will work. Yeah. Cassie, thank you for coming. Thank you very much for Kathleen, having me. Indeed. Kathleen Adi is chairperson of the National Commission on Civic Education. We've been having a, uh, you know, a very interesting and thrilling uh, conversation, also very insightful, on our lives today. Elections, mm -hmm. corruption, mm -hmm. the fight against Galamse, mm -hmm. and what your responsibilities are as a citizen of this country. We'll see you again same time next week. Bye-bye.